Today's podcast is brought to you by Delupa. Delupa's database of over 2,500 models contains the most KPIs for each company, along with non-GAAP adjustments and guidance specific to the business and the quarter. Clients use Delupa's existing data to construct their own models faster and ramp up on new names more readily. Coupled with Delupa's plugin, which automatically updates numbers and formatting within your model, you'll never need to input numbers manually again. All of Delupa's data points are contextual, audible, and accurate. Their AI algorithms allow them to collect the most data on their companies at the greatest speed and build out their model database at a rapid pace, while their final layer of human analysts ensures total accuracy of their models. You can even update KPIs for multiple different companies in an industry model that allows you a bird's eye view for better idea generation. Save time with Delupa to do more value-added work. No more data errors, no more Excel monkeying, just the fundamentals, all at your fingertips. All right, hello, and welcome to yet another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, it would mean a lot if you could rate, subscribe, review it wherever you're listening to it. Uh, with me today, I'm happy to have on for the second time, James Elbar. James is the founder and CIO of Marlton. James, how's it going? It's going well. Good to see you again, Andrew. Hey, it's great to see you too. Uh, let me start this podcast the way I do every podcast. First, uh, disclaimers to remind everyone, nothing on this podcast is investing advice. We're going to be talking about a stock that mainly trades international today. So just remember that comes with a little bit of added risk, a little bit of added uh, maybe tax complexities there. We're not tax advisors, but everyone should just please consult a financial advisor, do your own work. And then second, a pitch for you, my guest, you know, people can go listen to the first co- podcast from, I can't believe it was all the way summer 2021. It feels like it was pr- much sooner than that, but uh, great to have you back on. I think you're a super smart guy. I know you know this name really well, and you caught some really interesting tidbits in the disclosures, which shows how closely you're reading the filings. But uh, all that out the way, let's just turn to this company we're going to talk about. It's not a company. It's actually a closed end fund. It's Pershing Holdings. The ticker is PSH. It trades over in London. And I'm just going to stop there and turn it over to you. James, what is PSH and why is it so interesting? Oh, gosh. Well, it's great to be back. Uh, Similar to the last conversation that we had, we talked about third point offshore. And today we're going to talk about Pershing Square Holdings, which I should remind everybody is not only on the London Stock Exchange, it's also on the Euronext as a dollar uh, that trades USD. And then there's also a pink sheet uh, as well. Um, but there's a couple of different ways to get it, but I think probably the best is usually trading through the, through the Euronext. But like you were saying, it, Pershing Square Holdings is a closed end fund. Uh, it's an investment holding company run by Bill Ackman, and it's incorporated currently in Guernsey, which is important because the main crutch of our conversation here is that. I think it's going to re-domicile to the United States, which creates a really interesting event path and investment opportunity. But like, let's take a quick step back and describe what this is, because one of the things that you said was it's a closed-end fund. And it is a closed-end fund, but I think the way that Bill is positioning this, the way that it is run, is really more like an investment holding company. So I think people should really start to, and will start to see this as more like a Berkshire Hathaway or an Icon Enterprises. Let's talk about what this is not. This is not a reinsurance company like some hedge funds have. And this is not a feeder fund like Third Point Offshore, which is a fund into, it's a company that's investing into a hedge fund. This is truly, you know, you are making an investment into the holding company of Pershing Square Holdings. They make direct on balance sheet investments into underlying securities, principally North American. Right now they have nine companies, they're long only. And yes, I'm sure it's going to come up. They have a very interesting swaption on interest rates. We don't know exactly where on the curve they are, but we can talk about that a little bit. So I think maybe what might be helpful when I was thinking about this and thinking about some of the listeners here is why Guernsey? So Pershing Square Holdings is basically domiciled in Guernsey right now to avoid 
compensation or specifically the carried interest restrictions. There's other regulatory restrictions as well, but mainly the carried interest restriction that is imposed by the Investment Company Act of 1940. So that is why they're incorporated, generally incorporated in Guernsey right now. So that brings the question, okay, how are you not deemed an investment company under the 40 Act? And one way to look at that, I would encourage everybody to kind of figure out, find their own opinion as to how this happens. And one of the ways that we did it was pull up Berkshire Hathaway's 10K. You can read very, you can just control find the 40 Act and they will very succinctly describe to you why the 40 Act does not apply to them. And I'm going to read part of, part of that right here. It says, the company does not invest or intend to invest in securities as the primary business, and no more than 40% of total assets will be invested in investment securities, as such term is defined in the Investment Company Act. And what we think is, Bill is telegraphing and has been telegraphing that they are going to make the move from Guernsey, which is where they are currently trading as a, essentially acting like a hedge fund, right? Just incorporating Guernsey, trading regular securities, and will be more like a US domiciled investment holding company like a Berkshire Hathaway. But in order to do that, as we said, trading securities need to be less than 40% of your assets. And Berkshire Hathaway gets around that by, huh? owning Geico in the sense their insurance company, Icon Enterprises has uh, um, energy companies that are so affiliated with them that they have full control over. And then you've also got Kanai, which is Bill Foley's holding company, uh, which has consolidated other other businesses as well. I'm laughing because I didn't think we'd bring Bill Foley in here, but I, I'm, you familiar, gotta bring with, Big Foley I'm familiar with all of them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so maybe, you know, one of the things that's actually pretty interesting right now about Pershing Square Holdings is the discount to NAV. So it's trading currently at around a 35% discount to its net asset value. And what's, there's various different, I think might be helpful to maybe talk a little bit if you think about why the discount to NAV exists. Yep. Right. So we think of it as three reasons primarily. So reason one is the concentration of the Pershing Square portfolio is nine long only equity positions. Two, he employs leverage. So if you look at how the portfolio was running in January, it was running about 128% net long. Uh, today, the portfolio is 106% net long as he is taking that down. Uh, I think what's really important worth mentioning because I know that Bill would mention it, uh, is that the debt is true debt. These are bonds, so this is not margin debt. So if Pershing Square were to find themselves in a market downturn, there is no risk uh, that they're going to get a margin call um, on, their, on their securities because they just don't use margin debt. And then three, what we think is really actually coming on here is that traders or investors just can't arbitrage the underlying NAV. Huh? Because Pershing Square trades LSE Euronext market hours, so European market hours, but has underlying investments that trade New York Stock Exchange market hours. Huh? So it makes sense that in a portfolio that's concentrated and levered, huh, that you would have a, you'd apply some type of a discount and probably a significantly larger discount than you would normally apply, um, given the fact that if all of a sudden the market starts to tank as we have volatility right now, there's no way that you're going to be able to move out of your Pershing Square holdings position, especially if you have that margin. Margin. So all these reasons and all the different things that Bill has done to close this discount, and there are many, and we can spend almost an entire podcast talking about what a great capital allocator he's been for shareholders thus far, including buying back shares, uplisting to, to the London Stock Exchange premier selection, huh? uh, starting the dividend that is now actually he increased the dividend recently. Huh? There's plenty of shareholder friendly things that he's done. We think the most shareholder friendly thing that he will do 
his redomicile and move into the United States. And once he does that, you're no longer looking at a valuation on net asset value. You're no longer saying, well, James, you know, is this now, is Pershing Square, are you saying, is it going to be a 35% discount to a 10% discount? No, Berkshire Hathaway trades at a 1.36 times book value. Huh? You know, IEP trades at 1.6. It's a little bit misleading because of the energy holdings that he has. Huh? You know, historically, it's traded closer around like 1 to 0.8 times book, but... Hmm. Yes, Kanai, Kanai historically is traded at 1.2, so that's a 20% premium to book value. And, and just to take this back, just because I think that this is a headline that I even forgot to mention, Ackman has compounded uh, over the last 18 years at 17.5%. Uh, 17.5% over the last 18 years, that's including Valiant and Herbalife. Uh, so you know, we think that there's just plenty of upside. I'm going to pause there if you have questions, because then I can kind of go into the math as to how this really starts to look attractive over the next two years, but uh, open it up. No, this has been great. Look, you've done all my work for me. You hit most of my questions that I had over here. So I I'm going to try and add some stuff to, you know, earn my keep as a podcast host, but let, let me, let me just bounce around through a couple things. Now, I the last thing you said, so I, I think a piece of your thesis is there's a lot of pieces, right? Like it trades for a 30 to 35% discount to NAV. Uh, Ackman's got a great track record, right? So if you think he does 15 to 20% from here, that 30% NAV with buybacks, 15 to 20% annualized, like that just, it, the growth is incredible, right? So there's that piece of it. You think that that NAV discount can collapse because he might do a US, buy some US operating company, get a US listing. I know they talked about US listings in general, there's some annual, we'll get to that. Uh, all, all that type of stuff. But let me just start the last thing you mentioned, right? You said, hey, it, if he comes to the US, if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, trades at 1.3 times books. Kanai trades at 1.2 times book. IEP trades at 1.6 times book. And I think my first pushback there would be, okay, I get you. He's going to come over here and this is going to trade for, uh, and you think this could close the gap if he comes over here and gets that operating company. But my first pushback would be, well, yeah, but like, Berkshire Hathaway trades at 1.3 times book, but Geico is held on the books at like what they acquired it for in 1992 or something. Uh, Kanai, I know for a fact, because I've done a lot of work there, like they've got a lot of these startup investments and every now and then they'll IPO one and it'll turn out, oh, lo and behold, it, it was worth five times book. And like people have got pretty good insight into that. So I, I would kind of push back and say, look, if he comes over here, I don't know what the fee structure will be. And we'll probably talk fees in a second. But if he comes over here and he buys name your company to get a listing over here. I still feel like it would probably trade at a discount because people would just look at it and be like, okay, cool. He paid an acquisition premium to get it he over here. We've still got the fees and we've got some really liquid publicly traded stocks. Maybe it gets a little bit better because there's a little bit more ARB opportunity, but maybe it gets a little bit worse because people look and say, okay, cool. He owns, he owns 10 large cap, really nice companies. And then this unhedgeable U.S. operating business. So it's really just a bet on Bill Ackman's capital allocation going forward, which is probably a very good bet. But I could see how it goes the other way from what you're talking about. Yes, I, I don't I don't totally disagree with you. I think that there's realistically, we think that this is going to play out between 18 and 24 months. I think that this is a pretty big focus for them right now. And also what we never even mentioned, which is what's worth mentioning, while while Marlton, um, my firm has been talking about this since 2018, huh, that we think that this is what Bill's going to do. The last, the last annual report, which I encourage everybody to read, makes it abundantly clear that, per, that Pershing Square at the board level and at the investment management company level, Bill is thinking about it. In fact, there's a literal line in there that says, huh, the way for us to close this discount is to redomicile, and we are continually and will potentially explore options on that. But can sorry, I just say quick clarification? Was it the last semi annual report or the annual report? Semi annual report. It was the, I, I thought it was the semi. I just wanted to clarify yep. in case anybody's going to go check us on that. But yep. everything else you said, I 100% agree with. Yeah. So, so starting there, so taking, taking a step back, the reason why I bring that up is we think that realistically, this will just take, this is going to take some time. There's a few things that are going to happen. One, there's going to be an announcement 
of potentially of some type of a target. Um, there's going to have to be some type of financing involved. We think that whatever target it's going to be is likely going to be real estate in nature. I know that he has more of a consumer background, but remember, one of the things that we're trying to fix here is how do we get trading securities to be under 40%? So you need an asset heavy business. And one of an asset heavy business that you can add a lot of leverage to is real estate outside the fact that Bill has had such fantastic experience with general growth and the experience there. So we think that it's going to be real estate in nature. That is to say, I agree with you huh, that initially, I don't see this trading at a massive, necessarily a huge premium where you're looking at Berkshire and saying, well, you know, it's 1.4 times book and they acquired Geico forever ago. And, and that, is, that is true. They, they did do that. Huh? Um, and that is how accounting works. What I do see is happening, though, is that these liquid securities should realistically, in our closed and fun experience, trade anywhere between a 10% discount to par. And I think that it's highly realistic that what you're really playing for here is a par like value as people then start to assign what is the value then if we give par to huh, the actual trading securities, then what's the value of operating company huh, going to be? And then how do we kind of value the sum? And altogether, I think you'll get to something of probably current NAV huh, uh, in between as it works out. Yeah, there, should, there can be downside for sure. And look at uh, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes trades at a at a pretty significant discount, huh? right? And when you think about the value there, so it's it's highly likely that a discount remains. Uh, we just think that it's not thirty five percent. We just think if, that it's something more closer to like ne to current nav of negative ten to par. And it's funny because. I posted this on Twitter, obviously, and there were two or three questions that were most common, but the most common by far was, when does the discount close? Which I get it. Like, mm -hmm. invest in a security, trades at a 30% discount to NAV. Everybody wants that to close the next day, right? But it's funny we're saying this because, tell me if I'm wrong, I think the core thesis for you is Ackman's compounded 17% annualized over the past 20 years or something along those lines, right? It's like, hey, if he's going to do 12% annualized for the next 20 years, you're really not going to care if that discount closes now. By the way, it might be better because you can keep buying back those shares, which will, which will be very accretive and increase that compounding. But it is funny how focused, and I'm focused, you're focused. It's where our, all of our minds goes. But if you can get over to the U.S., get the cash flow from an operating business, and then start repurchasing shares, like you kind of get that snowball rolling. So, it's, can I just also say I think yeah. he gets while well, Bill gets is obviously very public facing. He gets a lot of criticism. I want to say two things for at least Pershing Square shareholders that have, like myself, that have experienced this. We're, we have an absolutely incredible capital allocator at the helm. And this isn't just because he's a smart person. Let me give a good, really good example right now. We were, we were right in the midst of this year. Her share buybacks at Pershing Square had stopped. Huh? Why? Because they were deploying capital. Huh? No, no sooner than May of this year, to, Pershing Square has bought back $113 million notional worth of shares at a 35% discount to NAB. That's 2%. That's 2% of the float. That was an immediate move by the Pershing Square board and investment manager in order to make that capital allocation decision. They made that incredibly nimbly. That is not a typical, what you typically see at the corporate level where these types of buyback programs are longer, they are more, they're more thought out and not always accretive because they're kind of just done well where we have a buyback program and we're just running through, through the numbers. This is done in a very nimble way. And I also wanna say, I give Bill a lot of credit that while um, you know, there's a lot of time and focus spent on Tontine, huh, he could have done a really bad deal and he chose not to. And at the same time, is moving forward with Spark. You know, Spark is still moving forward. There's still show, you know, there's still that shelf filing, and we think that that's really possible to happen in the next three years. That that's going to happen. It won't be listed as we know, but it will certainly be OTC, and that's going to create its own event path. We're we're dealing with a an incredibly nimble huh, cap 
capital allocator that I think really surprises people continually. I don't know why it surprises people. It doesn't surprise me when I see these things, but um, it, it's it's somebody who is very much on the side of shareholders and the structure in general is on the side of shareholders. Uh, Ackman himself, now through various different trusts, as has been publicly disclosed, is is the largest shareholder in Pershing Square Holdings. Let me, so you said, and I, I hadn't thought this fully through, but you said in order to avoid the investment port, yeah, you, you probably, Pershing, if they want to come to the U.S. and buy, buy, buy an operating business, they probably need to do something with a lot of assets, a lot of book value assets so that they can come. You know, they're not going to do a U.S. franchiser or something because there's no assets there. So they would just still be an investment holding company, even if the franchiser was hugely, hugely valuable. You mentioned real estate. So I just want to ask, I know several people have mentioned to be like, hey, would they just buy all of HHC and use that as their operating company? And I don't know, obviously, Bill's got all, HHC is one of the nine companies that they're invested in. Bill's got a lot of knowledge of HHC. It's been a kind of controversial stock. It's kind of gone nowhere since the spin, despite lots of upside. I love South side, but do you think HHC is the target or do you think he's going to kind of do something of his own? And if it's not HHC, like what type of real estate do you think it would be? My my inkling is, is that HHC plays a role in this story in some way. So you're looking at right now, Pershing Square owns roughly around 20%, uh, a little over possibly of the shares outstanding. Huh? It is a real estate play. Uh, it could be levered. It wouldn't surprise me if there was a play for HH Howard Hughes and as well as Howard Hughes buying something else or Pershing Square and Howard Hughes doing a much larger deal. What's what's really fun about this is that, again, not to kind of re-say what I just said, you have a capital allocator who's not afraid of doing anything that's very complicated. Just look at history. Um, everything that we've just seen in the last 36 months with, with the uh, Bill Ackman has been something that has been completely out of the box, very shareholder friendly, um, especially to shareholders that are aligned with him. Huh? And I, I hate to say the word complicated, but complicated in a way that's accretive to everybody involved. He's not shy of doing a deal that might take some explaining. Huh? But once it's explained, everybody gets on board and realizes, uh, oh, this makes a lot of sense and this is a great deal. So to answer your question, do I think it's Howard Hughes? I think Howard Hughes plays a big role in this. It wouldn't surprise me if it's a play for Howard Hughes and Howard Hughes is buying um, another partner as well. I, and then just another question, forget Howard Hughes, forget the target. Where do they find the money to buy something? Because this is a company that's 100% invested right now. The shares are trading at a 30% discount to NAV. Obviously, you can get you can get a decent bit of leverage on if you go buy office towers or something. I don't think fully leased up office towers is the target. I just throw that out there. But like, yeah. where do they get the money to go buy an operating business that's going to be big enough that they're not going to be registering under the Investment 40 Act? It's a it's a liquid portfolio. You know, we saw them move out of Netflix incredibly quickly through what was an over billion dollar notional position. Um, I just I don't think that coming up with equity is going to be a problem. And depending on what the target is, I don't think that coming up with either co investors through equity co invest and or a line of credit. Uh, any type of credit that they're going to try and put on this from a debt perspective is going to be hampering them from a deal. Guggenheim has, has advised them in the past and has done a really nice job structuring deals that can sometimes be hard to get done. So you wouldn't be surprised if they sold down a position to help fund this in part? Yeah, no, I wouldn't be surprised by that. You know the company better than me. I think I would be a little bit surprised by it just because there's nine companies like he he's talked so highly about all of them, but it, it, Certainly does make sense. Let me ask. Uh, okay, so turning back to the discount here, right? A lot of the, a lot of people say, "Hey, the discount is because a foreign listed all this." But the two other real pushbacks are fees 
and Ackman's reputation. We can talk Ackman. Let's do Ackman's reputation first because I'm with you. I've got uh, a lot of respect for him. But, uh, you know, the second most qu popular question we got, aside from when is the discount going to close, is, well, it trades at a discount because Ackman's going to blow up again, right? Which I think is like, I I've got feelings. I think that's very disingenuous, but people point to the Valiant experience and the Herbalife experience. And they say, look, it it's, it's uninvestable. It's trading at a discount because he's going to blow up. I say, look at the portfolio, look at his history, but that's just my thoughts. I'll pause there. Like, what do you think to, what would you respond to people who say, just look at the blow up history? And actually people will even go back to his first hedge fund. I think it was Gotham Partners. They'll even go back to his sure. first hedge fund and say, look at that history. Right. Um, I would say for every, if, <laughs> I, I almost don't even know how to answer this question with a straight face. I know, um, but it's but, the second I mean, most I popular try. question. I, will try. I mean, it's the second most popular question. If I can, for, for the next 18 years, compound at 17 and a half percent with multiple public failures and do it with a smile on my face and still treat shareholders right then i will have lived a very full life so not only that but I mean, you and me that, will, will be seeing each other on the beach if that's the case right you know what's funny about that let me just go ahead and take that one step further you said we'll be seeing each other on the beach you know who's not on the beach right now bill Ackman, because he's out there making people money huh so like if like ourselves who are investors in his in pershing square i mean that's that's what's so fascinating to me it's like yes um i think you have a very passionate person who puts a lot out there but the numbers speak for themselves if the numbers were terrible then don't in, don't invest but at the same time i would say look at where your other options are hard to find people that are that uh, honest that upstanding that shareholder aligned that have compounded at those types of numbers but another question and the other way to explain the discount is the fees right so yep. closed in fund right now as we talked about this might not be a closed in fund forever but it would still probably be a controlled company and the fees are 1.6 and 16, if I remember correctly. So 1.6% asset management fee, and then 16% of the profits are going to Pershing, Bill, Bill Ackman, right? That is high. You know, anybody who invests in mutual funds will know that's a lot higher than mutual funds, but that's high for closed-end funds on the whole, I would say. Most closed-end funds in the US don't have an incentive fee, I don't think. It's higher. And a lot of people just say, hey, it's a liquid portfolio of nine large cap US stocks. Of course, it's going to trade at a discount when it's got that fee structure associated with it, because we can just, Aquin's very public, we can just copy his portfolio, build it ourselves and not pay that fee structure. So it has to trade at a discount to attract investors. What would you say about that? Well, I would say that that's not entirely accurate. So in true uh, Ackman style, it's the devils and the details and in the numbers. So Pershing's where runs levered. It's a long only portfolio minus the swaption, which is treated more like a, a liquidity pool. But it's a levered. It's a levered long portfolio. And what the leverage does is it minimizes actually the fee drag. Huh? So when you when Bill and the team and IR when, and I fully tell people that Tony Ness, uh, the head of IR, long-term head of IR at Pershing Square is very readily available to answer anybody's questions that I encourage them to reach out to Tony because he's helpful in this respect. If you look at the leverage um, and you run the portfolio huh, side by side, what ends up happening is that you're end up, you end up getting the gross return of what it would be huh, had they not had the fees because of the leverage. Huh? So the leverage ends up basically compensating you huh, for the fees and compensating them for the fees. Now, if we're going to talk about the fees in and of themselves being too high, I want to point to the fact that you have a team that has incredible retention. That is an incredible team. Ryan Israel, who was just appointed uh, CIO, has been there since 2000, basically 2009, 2010, huh? when he was formerly at Goldman's special sits group huh? uh, before leaving and joining Pershing Square. One way that you keep a Ryan Israel and uh, keep him motivated, keep him on board is by compensating him. Yep. You know, we're, we're in a capitalist society and people go where the money is. Ryan's not going to go start his own fund because he has a really great seat at Pershing Square where he's highly compensated and it wouldn't actually make viable sense for him to probably leave and start his own fund because of the fact uh, that he is very well compensated.
compensated based on the structure there. Tony, uh, the head of IR, has been has has been there for also decades, or possibly since inception, I believe. So you're looking at least you know at least over two decades, uh, almost two decades, that your head of IR has been at Pershing Square. I think I think team continuity is really really important, especially as this as this firm continues to build. So if you're going to look at other larger asset managers, now I don't think of Pershing Square Holdings as an asset manager, but if you look at those, they're all struggling with their legacies. Many of them are struggling with where, what is succession planning? What does this look like? Who are we bringing in? Uh, you, we, we don't have that problem at Pershing Square. Her, now, you know, we can have a different debate as to, are they overcompensated? Are they pay too much? Possibly, but uh, you know, I again say the net returns speak for themselves, uh, and that's where that's where people are going to choose to put their dollars. If if I am wrong and they're overcompens and they are overcompensated such that the net return is no longer attractive, we won't stick around. Huh? But I think that Bill has been really thoughtful around structuring comp and having that carried interest component, such that people are encouraged to stay around and put their best work forward. Let me go, so no disagreements there, but let me go back to the first part of what you were saying. You said the leverage kind of can be used to offset the fees, which I get that that is a rational, ar- that that is an argument, right? If you're running 150 long and it, there's no margin, so you can you can hold that through thick and thin, right? Like that will offset a lot of the fees, give people beta upside, all that type of stuff. But right now they are 106 long, right? So they're basically not levered at this point. So does that change your calculus at all? Um, does it change the calculus? I would say yes and no. Again, at the beginning of the year, they were running 128. Now they're running 106. There's an averaging out. I think we need to give some credence to the investment committee and the team there as to how they want to flex their net in the environment. you know, so I don't want to penalize them too much for saying, well, you're not running consistently at 128. If the opportunity feels more around what they could be telegraphing or not, but what we think they could be telegraphing is we're waiting to deploy a little bit more capital or we're waiting to add to the portfolio at a time when we feel a little bit better or a little bit more stable from a macro perspective. Why, why do you think... Running 130 at the start of the year and one and 106 now, right? That's a pretty big 20 plus mm-hmm. net net drawdown in exposure. Uh, stocks are lower now. Obviously, there's a Ukraine war. There's a lot of macro uncertainty. We're going to talk interest rate swaps in a second. Inflation, but you know, it does strike me if you were 128 when this when stocks were higher and now you're 106. Like, why why do you think that change? It, it strikes me it should be the inverse, right? Yeah, you could think of it as the inverse. I don't. I don't necessarily. I, all the reading that I've done has shown from the previous letters of Bill have shown they're not. Bill is not a market timer. Um, he is. He's a long-term investor. Many of these positions have been held for a very, very long period of time. Um, if I was, without doing a complete forensic analysis, but just looking off the cuff, it really wouldn't surprise me if the option and the movements in in the pricing of the swaption has really changed gross uh, gross leverage up and down huh? Be- because the swaption by definition has a lot of notional exposure and so you're going to get a lot of p l in fact just to because we talked about it and I I did the I did the math so when you look at it year to date huh, well actually before, let, yeah, let, okay, I'll let take me a ask pause. about I'll the swaption before you get there just yeah. so people yeah, yeah. so uh, look, in the past two years, Ackman's made two just absolutely magnificent uh, macro calls, right? The first was mm-hmm. the famous buying CDS tr- right before COVID hit, which might have been the best trade of all time. And then the second was late last year, he starts buying interest rate swaptions, which basically lets him bet on raging inflation, in interest rates going up, all that type of stuff, which has paid off beautifully. Uh, the Get lots of Lots of thoughts around that, right? But I guess the first thing is a lot of people think those have paid off well. But right now, a lot of people think that uh, the inflation, the interest rate swaptions 
are really burning a hole in his pocket, right? You have to pay, you have to pay on them every month to keep them going. And a lot of people think, oh, they're not paying off quickly enough. He's burning a lot of premium on those swaptions. I might not have said that perfectly right, but I think that was the general gist. So can I ask you, you know, kind of on a, how much is he paying as a percentage of the portfolio per month on these swaptions? We don't have a good view on the per month on the per month that we're spending. But when we, one thing that, so one thing I would encourage everybody to take a look at is there are wonderful transparency reports on the Pershing Square websites. They are on the website. They are very transparent with shareholders. You could easily see on a month by month basis what their exposures are, as well as what the attribution is. So looking, just looking year to date on the long book only, the gross performance uh, attribution has been negative 24%. So that's saying, you know, without any swaptions uh, and you, now there's, there's flexing of the leverage there, right? But we're saying that the gross, the gross attribution of the log book has been negative 24%. The short attribution, which is the swaption, has been 7.3% positive. Huh? So it's been a positive net for him. Now, yes, I think if you're not going to say, I will go ahead and say the criticism might Itself. There is a criticism that you know, we used a good or Pershing Square used a good good chunk of the short attribution from the swaption to plow it into Netflix, which then is clearly a long performance drag. Um, so when you kind of net it all out, how's it how does it look? I haven't really we haven't really looked at that deeply into that. One thing that we have done though is saying this is this isn't really a source of PL for Pershing Square as much as it's a source of liquidity. And they've been very, very strong in, in making sure that shareholders understand that and think of it that way. You know, when they while they've made great macro calls and there have been there have been many, and there have been other macro calls that have not worked out worked out so well. Uh, some Can you name a macro that's... call that didn't work out well for them? I believe that there was a macro call uh, back that was a currency situation around the devaluation of the yuan um, in China. I'm not absolutely super accurate about that, but it was- I asked because I, I could I honestly just couldn't remember one. So I, I was, uh, but I, was looking, I could but, remember were swaptions in COVID. Yeah, uh, there's swaptions and there's COVID, but there's actually, you can, if you go back, there's tons of letters. All the previous letters are up on the Pershing Square website and you can read back. And I believe that there was one, on where um, a DPEG or devaluation of the one was something that Bill had been had been playing that hadn't really worked out all that well, but actually didn't cost the fund all that much. But at the end, at the end of the day, I think you get you get a macro overlay that is seen as a source of liquidity, uh, and then you have what is essentially a private equity portfolio huh, on on the other side that that mimics very much the style of Berkshire Hathaway. So you. Know, Restaurant Brands International has been held by Pershing Square for, uh, gosh, I want to say almost a decade now. Huh? If I remember, uh, Restaurant Brands International came public through Justice Holdings, which was Athens' first SPAC. And like, so he he took the SPAC, right. took Restaurant Brands, and then he hasn't sold a share. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is also highly tax efficient, but I mean that's that's for another that's for another time. Let me let me ask. So just digging with the interest rates rate swaptions and the uh, the COVID. So the macro plays. I've heard a couple, one kind of conspiracy theory on them, and then a couple criticisms. So I just want to run them by you. The first would be the conspiracy theory, and that's this. Look, Ackman does <laughs> he does these. I think he does them to make money and stuff, but some people say, look, he does these so publicly because he wants people to know, look, yes, our portfolio is very public. Yes, our portfolio is very liquid. You could go create this by yourselves, but we're going to make these macro trades. You probably can't create them by yourself. And when we do them, you will not know. So you won't be able to recreate them at the time. And these can be very time sensitive, right? With COVID, if he had tried to put that on three weeks later, it's, it's a nothing burger. So uh, COVID was a real thing. It, it just, he couldn't have put those trades on if he had tried it three weeks later, right? So uh, a lot mm -hmm. of people think he's doing these macro trades, not necessarily to make money though, you know, scoreboard, but it, he's doing them to lure people, almost lure people in stock saying, hey, this is the thing that our SOC has that you can't get anywhere else. What would you say to people who said that? 
Well, for one, that is a fact. Um, um, you cannot get that anywhere else. Where else are you going to price that swap option? I mean, somebody else that's large with an ISDA can obviously price that swap option, but you can't. So I think the, the counter to that is, don't disagree with you that um, Bill is out there saying, invest, with, invest in this vehicle because we have this. Uh, it is true that they have this. That's a fact. So what we're not talking about is somebody who's being disingenuous in saying we have this when in reality they don't, or it's like a minor piece of the portfolio. You, you have somebody who's saying that we have this, they actually do have it, and it is material. So you make your decision with all the information that you have in, in order to do, to do that. Um, so I'm not sure if that's really necessarily a, a criticism. It's yeah. Um, does that does that make sense? No, I, I think that's maybe fine, I can pull, push on that. Push on I, that a little I, bit more. I was just surprised how many. I mean, I I've, I've had the thought before, but I I was surprised by how many people have suggested that to me, and like. I would do anything to, I would do anything that publicly would, marketed if I was making hundred X on the trades or something. So it's not even just marketing that. Let me just, let me just give the, the counter to that is the counter is what is being suggested then is saying, well, actually, um, Bill, as the now CEO of Pershing Square Holdings, he should, he should not tell people that he had or the people that he has these swaptions on. Well, first of all, I would be, I'm going to be frustrated as a shareholder. Her, I'm a shareholder of Pershing Square. I'm actually a material shareholder of Pershing Square Holdings, specifically for me. Um, and I, I want and I value that kind of transparency in my manager, her saying, this is what we have on. Then I can make my choice as to whether or not I want to stay or not, or how I need to think about that. I prefer that vastly to what I think could be, could be the counter to that, which is we have we had this swaption on and look how much money we made. And we never told you that we had the swaption on before. And it's like, no, that's not the situation. In fact, what it's always been is we have a swaption on. And then it just turns out that it actually made money and it worked. But if it had it not worked, I think that Bill would say if he was on here uh, and I challenge him, I think Bill would actually be the first person to go ahead and say, yeah, we had the swaption on, it didn't work, and it lost us money. Uh, and he'd own up to that. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a marketing play. I think it's more of a transparency situation. Second question, and this is swaption specific, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I do, it, it has struck me as a little strange that Bill is, I believe he's on the investment advisory committee for the New York Fed. I think that's his specific role. He's got ties to the New York Fed in some way. Yeah. And he's making presentations to the New York Fed, arguing for higher in higher interest rates, really focusing on fighting inflation and all this sort of stuff. And he's doing that at the same time. I mean, he even tweeted out or put on the Persian Square website, the presentation he did to the New York Fed. And he's doing all that at the same time that he's got this interest rate swaption going on. And I understand, like, I understand he thinks inflation is a serious problem. That's why he put this on. That's why he's, he's doing it. But at the same time, it's like, don't ask your, your barber if you need a haircut, right? Like somebody who would really benefit from interest rates going up and the Fed fighting inflation even more aggressively, and he has a tie to it. Like, how can he make this bet and be on the Fed, the Fed committee and all that type of stuff? You know, it just feels yeah. conflict of interest to me, especially for someone who we're out here arguing has a lot of integrity, cares about shareholders. Like, that's just a very strange piece. Let me let me ask if about the integrity piece here. So just so I can just pair this back and understand the criticism. The criticism is, is Bill, uh, publicly discloses that he sits on this committee. He huh, publicly pre-discloses that he has this swaption on. He then publicly discloses that he has a view that interest rates should go up, which he also publicly discloses he could benefit from. And that's a conflict of interest and a problem versus uh, something like my husband makes trades and I'm a senior person, i.e. Nancy Pelosi. So I think that they're not necessarily the same. Um, you know, no, no necessarily view positive or negative on, on Ms. Pelosi, but I see them as vastly different when you have somebody who, as we just agreed, is literally saying this. One, by the way, you know how we're finding out about this. We're finding out about Bill and his presentation because he put it out there. We're not finding out about it from the New York Post 
that is re that is back running trades that are not easily disclosed. So I think we're dealing with a very different. I think you know if the criticism. I think the criticism is. Bill's just really good at his job, and he just happens to be really transparent about it. And people can say what they want to say and be critical of it, and I get that. But I no, think it, you it, cannot it, criticize the guy for being transparent because he's been transparent. It's not like okay, he hid this, uh, and this thing happened. It's like it's 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 vastly different to me. It, it's <laughs> funny you mentioned the congressional trading because I, I've personally been of the view like Congress people shouldn't be allowed to trade individual stocks. Like I don't see <laughs> how that's even a okay. but. The one, more than what you just said, the one I would almost equate it to is, do you remember at the height of COVID in February, a bunch of senators like got public, it got private briefings and they immediately call up their brokers and sell everything. And then they go on TV and say, everything's okay. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. And I understand you don't want to incite panic in people and stuff, but they were literally be liquidating their entire portfolios. And I would compare that to this where Bill puts a position on very publicly says, I have this position, and then goes and argues to the Fed, hey, I have this position. Here's why you need to take this stuff seriously. Like, at least it's full, like, pretty much open kimono versus the other side. That's the one I would more equate it to. But yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I just think of them as, as night and day. I, I, my, I, I believe not just from my own personal experience, but I think anybody's experience with, uh, Bill has always been nothing but inc the highest of integrity and very open and honest. If anything, the criticisms that I've heard is that uh, if you if you were going to tell me that Bill is on a very high horse and thinks so highly of himself that he's like this absolute white knight, I would totally agree with you. But he also talks the talk and walks the walk. So I mean, I can't fault him for it. Let me so. Uh, just looking at the portfolio, at this point, there are nine names and they're largely, if I had to describe them, it is large cap, growthy, not growthy-ish, but growing typical, growing better than your average stock, much better business than your average company holding. So like, you know, the, the one that pops in my mind immediately is Hilton, Domino's before he sold it. That's a franchise or really nice growth. It's not hyper growth, but it's good growth, lots of cash flow. And most of them trading are trading in the 20 to 25 times free cash flow range, right? That, that's just broad, broad strokes of everything. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would have two questions on that. The first, do you think his portfolio, his portfolio there is also coloring his views on the inflation swaption? And I mean it in this way. The inflation swaption works really well because higher interest rates are death for stocks trading at 20 to 25 times free cash flow. So you kind of get both sides, right? Interest rates go up, your stocks go down. So the interest rate, the interest rate protection goes up. If they don't pay off, well, your stocks probably go up because if interest rates go from three to two, well, your 20 times free cash flow earnings go to 30 times free cash flow earnings. Does that yeah. make sense? It does, and I think that that's absolutely accurate because that is very much in line with the way that we see Bill running the portfolio. As if in a, a rising interest rate environment, uh, those swaptions at when he decides to exit them or decides to ladder exit them, however he believes the best way to play it is, they will provide liquidity huh, to then buy into or add to these positions or buy new positions at lower or more attractive valuations. Uh, um, I think it is significantly more efficient to have the swaption uh, and provide liquidity than try to sell and exit these positions, many of which he's a D filer on or, and certainly a 13F filer on where he's going to have to disclose that he, that he sold down some of these positions. I, I just don't think that that's, that that's efficient. I don't think that that's accretive to shareholders and Persian square holdings. I, I think that what's the way that Bill is running it is the way I would like to see it be run uh, so, you know, with transparency, with in integrity, but also in a way that is actually really elegant. Uh, you know, this swaption provides a lot of liquidity huh, in an environment where interest rates may be continually going up. Let me ask the second question. The yeah. the portfolio. I mean, I have no I have no issues with it. I like I, I've done some work on some of the companies here. I like most of the companies in here, right? Like especially Hilton. I, I've mentioned that a few times, but I, I really like that business and that thesis. But when you just look at again, broad strokes, it's 20 to 25, 20 to 25 times free cash flow companies, 
growing nicely, but not hyper growth or anything. Lots of free cash flow, but they're not going to, you know, take over the world tomorrow or something. When you look at that portfolio, you know, you talked, you said earlier, one of the first thing you said is you're investing in a manager with a 20 year history of almost 20% annualized returns, right? How do you get close to that returns with this portfolio here, right? It's a, it's hundred percent invested. Basically it's invested in good companies that are trading 20, 25 times, but if they grow 5% and they yield 5% in terms of free cash flow, that's about a 10% return, which is better than the market will do over time. But it's hard to see, especially once you lay the fee on, fees on, how this is going to do materially better than that, unless I'm kind of missing something or you're factoring in a big macro call or he's going to sell all these and roll in something really interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. So I would say, um, look, if you're thinking... Typically, equities have been yielding around, you know, if you're looking at the S&P, like 10% annualized, let's put aside the fact that is a realized actual historical number that Bill has basically doubled that over the last 18 years. But putting that aside, if we think, okay, we have a five-year time horizon view, others might be longer, but let's just look out the next three to three-ish, uh, three or five. Um, let's say the portfolio is really going to be annualizing around 9 or 10%. Um, okay. Now you say you layer on the fees. Well, then you add on the leverage. So now you're looking still at 9 or 10%. Mm. So you're still looking at the, growth, uh, at the growth side. It's like, okay. And so then you're asking me, well, where are we going from? What should I be thinking about from here? Well, let me tell you what I think we should be thinking about. What we, what we need to go back to is the crutch of the thesis, which is twofold. First, you have a redomiciling effort that we think is going to be actively underway within 24 months, uh, where this will be moved. Huh? I, mean, I, I, I think high level in, in this, this is a permanent, this is Bill's only capital vehicle. This is not just one product or treated as a product. This is, this is it. Uh, and it is, you are looking at a person who is very patriotic, who we I firmly believe, and he has said himself, that Guernsey is just not um, the final destination for Pershing Square Holdings. So, and he's already been making moves to what we believe making moves to indicate that he's going to redomicile that. And so once we go through that redomiciling effort, you're now no longer, we're never longer going to be talking about Pershing Square, the portfolio. We're going to be talking about Bill Ackman's the invest the investment holding company. We're going to be thinking about this more around the view of Bill Ackman 3.0. Like, what is he doing at the operating company level? Whatever operating company that's going to be, how is he allocating cash to to the portfolio? How's the portfolio being run? Which is really, as he's been saying, going to be more aligned with Ryan uh, with Israel and how Israel is treating that portfolio. We think that this is like, we think we're at the beginning. I, I hate to say this because this is not like a Tesla you know, like company. Pershing Square Holdings, you are looking at something today that is not going to look like this in the future. Huh? What we are looking at today is not what, if you and I get back on the call huh? five years from now, six years from now, we're going to be talking about a vastly different company. And that is what is really exciting to me. You getting in, getting into Persian Square Holdings today gets you in to basically the ninth inning huh, of what was a, of what was previously a hedge fund. So a hedge fund, closed end fund, holding company to now something really, really exciting. Huh. I, I thought of this off the top of my head and I'm going to let you steal it, but you know, Bill is mid fifties and the way you describe it, it just like all of a sudden struck a chord with me. Like what you're describing with Persian Square Holdings is basically I mean, I think Buffett was in his late 30s at the time, but it, it's kind of equivalent in the late 60s or early 70s when Buffett returns all of the cash, share, all of his partnerships to shareholders and he gives them the Berkshire stock and he says, hey, you can keep this or leave it. Like you go from the fund to you get the, the kind of operating company. And what you're saying is Pershing PSH right now is kind of you're investing in that thing right on the verge from going from the hedge fund portfolio, it's the operating company portfolio. And, you know, if you follow those, uh, if you follow that line of thought, you know, Ackman's 55, that's actually pretty young for an investor. If you had invested in Berkshire when Buffett was 55, that would have been what, 
the late 80s or so if i'm doing the math off the top of my head right like that's right most be, most people would have been pretty happy with how berkshire performed from the late 80s till today so uh that, I that only sold us on to go ahead uh, no you're you're preaching to the choir i think that this is a very very exciting time for persian square holdings i think this is a very just really exciting time for per current persian square holdings investors and shareholders like like ourselves like me uh certainly me i i just i just really believe yes typically closed end funds are not sexy what i think is just so exciting about this situation is it's you are we are pre the transformation of a transformation that is being very methodically thoughtfully and carefully telegraphed huh, by bill this is this is not a capital allocator or a person that does rash decisions or makes uh, makes decisions that he is not fully committed to and sees them through huh uh, just history has shown committed and on both sides by the way so committed to valiant and that parabolic ride and also committed to general growth and that massive home run that that became huh? so um, that's how that's how i that's what i see and that's what i think is really incredibly exciting about it I, i'm internally laughing because if people just tuned in for that clip and this is just on my side they would have heard me comparing ackman to like a young to middle-aged buffett and i actually have huge respect for ackman but they'd be like oh he's just a homer but if they had listened 20 minutes ago they would have heard me talking about like conflicts at the fed or something they'll be like oh this guy really doesn't like Ackman or something so I, i'm just laughing on my end of it let me ask you one last question and then we'll kind of wrap this up but last question we've talked about rational capital allocation through all this right and i think the underlying trend through everything is if you're going to make this investment i mean you could try to arb and like hedge everything out and bet on the close and something but the underlying thing is if you're betting on per pershing you're really betting on ackman's capital allocation let's just say the pershing team's capital allocation there's one thing that strikes me as funny in there they pay this dividend right and their stock trades at a 30 percent plus discount to nav and they're paying a dividend and it just it, this is a rational guy, right? If he buys into a company, he's going to go to them and say, hey, you're trading at 50. I think you're worth 100. He's not going to say, I need you to start paying a, a $2 per share dividend every year so I can get a... He's going to say, I need you to take all your cash flow, do accretive, accretive growth investments, and everything else after that is buying back shares. And here's a guy who's taking money and sending it out the door instead of buying back shares when his liquid portfolio is trading at a 30 to 35 percent discount to NAV. So I just want to ask you on the yeah. dividend, like I, I, I know his arguments for him. How do you think about the arguments for the dividend? Okay. So we think of it, I I totally agree with you. We would prefer not to see the dividend. Now, however, the dividend is acts very much as a pick uh, at, at you at the shareholders choice. So we we do get a dividend. We choose not to take the dividend in cash. We take the dividend in shares, so which we're then getting you know, at a negative thirty five percent discount to, to yeah. But so putting that putting putting that aside, um, there there is actually a functional reason for the dividend. To, uh, mostly why I think a lot of people on this podcast are not actively hearing about Pershing Square Holdings as an actual company is because of the fact that they are incorporated in Guernsey while they are while they are while they are headquartered in the United States prevents them from marketing to US based investors. In fact, you don't hear about any closed end funds in London um, that are actively marketing to the United States because they're not allowed to. Um, so uh, part that means you have a shareholder base that is largely European. And from a cultural perspective as investors, those investors um, very much look positively towards dividends. And not only do they look positively, some of them actually have functional mandates that require them to invest in companies that pay dividends. So. As strange as that sounds, that is how it is across the pond in our conversations. And so the dividend is important for that shareholder base. Um, My pushback there would be like, that is that is doing something that looks good, but doesn't 
actually it fundamentally detracts from value, right? Because if you believe that you can create, if you believe you can compound value at higher than market rates, you should be keeping every dollar that you have. And to go back to I, earlier, I compared to Berkshire and Warren Buffett, like there's a reason I think Berkshire got one dividend out the door in the 60s or something. And Buffett was kind of, he joked like, hey, where was I during that meeting? But you don't pay dividends if you can compound at better than market rates. And particularly if you trade at a 30% discount, you don't pay dividends because you can just buy back your shares. And I get, yes, it pleases shareholders, but you know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot there that it looks like window dressing. And I think like hyper rational people, I'd understand it, but I would just rather not be there. I look, you're preaching to the choir here. We also would rather it not be there. And we would rather increase the share buyback program. And part of it was uh, also functional was that by buying back so many shares, and which they were decreasing the float actually prevented them from uplisting to the premium section of the London Stock Exchange to, to the FTSE, um, to the FTSE 100. And, you know, I think that that's like a really, that's a really big deal that's being understated right here. You have a U.S., basically U.S. headquartered business that is in the FTSE 100, 100 largest companies in, in the FTSE. Like that's a, that's a really big deal. It's a really big accomplishment. Um, and some of that had to do with just the actual logistics of share count, market cap, huh? and the fact that by buying back shares, you're you're, uh, you're decreasing the share count. So there's uh, there's some functional reasons for it. I get the argument. It's very difficult to defend. To I kind of think of it as slightly negligible, but it is something that we think is over time is just going to get evened up. I'm just laughing because you know what, you and I, James, on the heels of this podcast, we'll just go activists on Pershing and our, our one demand will be stop the dividend, buy back shares. Exactly, you know? exactly. Please, please, Bill, if you are listening, huh, you have two shareholders here that are telling you the dividend is not needed. It did strike me as, it did strike me as uh, interesting. One of the things you described in there, and then we can wrap this up is, look, Pershing is mainly known to use investing. Obviously, Bill's got a credit across you got uh, influence across the world, but their portfolio is basically all U.S. stocks, and it's listed in London. And there's they can only market to people in Europe. A lot of people want dividends. But one of my favorite catalysts has been like when you've got something that's only U.S. that all their operations are in the U.S. and it's listed in London. Like often, it sounds so simple, and I used to dismiss it so much, but it it kind of has been true. Once they listen to the U.S. and they can kind of get their natural owner base into it, the stocks do tend to, they, I, I again, I hate to say close the discount. The stock, stocks tend to work on a relisting when we're talking about a, somebody that I think the thesis is will compound at above average rates for a long time. But th that's just how it seems to work to me. Yeah, I would say real quickly, you know, we've been talking about this. We've been thinking that they were going to do this. We've been speaking with Tony that we would encourage them to do this since 2018. Huh? And it was the first conversation that we had with IR was, huh, please redomicile this business huh, and buy something. That's what we would like to see happen here. What I think is exciting and why it's timely for the podcast is that you now have Bill in writing saying that is an option that they are aware of, that they are thinking about. Huh? And Bill doesn't typically historically ever put anything in writing that he's not going to put effort behind huh? yep. so we just think that this is the time where huh, we're not just talking about a company that's in europe that's saying look they should just redomicile we're talking about a company in europe that is actively telegraphing huh, that they are aware and they are really thinking about it and so that's where i think the difference is so if you think if you're asking me how i think about it again not investment advice how i think about it i think about it as if we're trading at a 35 percent discount today which you are um how much do i amortize that over is that over two years because that's 15 percent annualized by the way huh? if that closes it to par just to par um, or is it you know 12 months i think that's a little tight but if you're looking at 12 months i mean that's 35 percent just from the move huh so i mean my point is is like there's there's a lot that the math works here in some pretty incredible ways huh? if you just think like we were talking about before if the portfolio is only annualizing at 10 percent huh? which we think is unlikely but let's say it annualizes only at 10 percent huh? 
And then on top of that, you have this redomiciling effort. If that happens in 24 months, you are looking at IRRs in excess of 40%. I mean, the IRRs like really become eye-popping here. Yep, yep. Well, hey, I, I actually have a dentist appointment. It's been about an hour. I want to give you your time back. So I, I think we'll wrap it up here. But the last two things I would say is, A, if they if they read it, domicile or do anything to close the NAV discount in the next 18 months, I think you and I 100% take credit. This podcast was the catalyst. There's no doubt about it. No one else can take credit. Absolutely. <laughs> and then the second thing, James, it was great. See, it was great having you on. Uh, you know, I didn't realize it'd been over a year. We've got to have you back on more frequently because this was a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. it and was. I looking forward here. to the third one. This is fun. Okay. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.